So now we pivot to a topic that's a little more comfortable than jumping in cold water, uh, but perhaps for some of us equally challenging, uh, which is uh, team science and academic medicine centers in pharma, and I think we have a lot to learn from our panelists. Um, so I'll just introduce our uh, moderator, Bhavan Sampat, who's an associate professor of health policy at Columbia University, and he in turn will introduce our panelists and take over from here. Bhavan. Thank you. Um, let me just, uh, it's a tough act to follow, tough act to follow. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna try. So uh, I'm Bob and Sampat, uh, I teach health policy and management and various other things at Columbia. Um, my own work's on the intersection of science policy and uh, uh, health policy, though I confess that uh, before yesterday I, I hadn't really thought all that much about, about team science, um, though I'm very interested in it and looking forward to learning from the distinguished panel and from, from the audience. Um, so at least my objectives for the panel that this will evolve are to think together about what team science means in in, in different contexts, in AMCs and in pharma, and how that might be similar and different, to uh, explore similarities and differences uh, across those contexts, and to think a little bit about the road forward ahead in each sector. Uh, one thing I did think about during the the last last session, and it was prompted by I don't see him here, but uh, the gentleman over here who asked the the first question. Uh, is the extent to which lessons on teamwork from other contexts, so we've heard now about sports and um, the military and music, uh, can and can't be applied to science both in uh, the public and private sector. So maybe we can get in a little bit into that as, as well. And like yesterday, uh, feel free to tweet any questions, any questions you may have. Okay, so let me briefly introduce the speakers and then uh, um, I'll let them say some things about themselves and, and how team science works in, in their context. Uh, uh, we have, we have uh, Noshir Contractor, uh, who has been uh, active both in studying team science and in, in forming teams. Dr. Contractor is a professor of behavioral sciences at Northwestern University. Um, he directs various labs that both study teams and also try to form teams. Um, in, 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 in science and in other contexts. And he's investigating factors that lead to the formation, the maintenance, and the dissolution of uh, dynamically linked social and knowledge networks. And he's gonna tell us what all that, what all that means. <laughs> uh, the next member of the panel is Dr. Laura Demopoulos, uh, who is the Executive Director of Discovery Medicine at GlaxoSmithKline. She's a graduate of MIT and of the NYU School of Medicine, has held academic positions at Albert Einstein and, and uh, University of Pennsylvania, has also worked extensively in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and so uh, she knows about teamwork, uh, both in the academic context and in the pharmaceutical industry, and we'll be interested in hearing her thoughts on that. Third speaker is Jonathan uh, uh, Dordick, who is the Vice President of Research and the Howard Iserman Professor of Chemical and Biological en Engineering at RPI. Uh, he has a, res uh, a research group that, well, you can just look at the, bi the official biography because it would take too long for me to read all the groups that he's put together, um, engineers, bioengineers, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, has a lot of experience uh, uh, in managing diverse teams and thinking about opportunities and challenges in, in team science. Uh, speaker, our panelist number four is, is Anja Koenig, who is uh, the managing director of the Novartis Venture Fund. Um, she's also spent some time at, at McKinsey. Um, in addition to doing a lot of work in healthcare, uh, on healthcare in the U.S., she's also done work on Europe and emerging markets. Uh, a scientist by training, she holds a PhD in physics from Cornell, uh, and has been thinking about Novartis's activities in, uh, uh, um, in Asia and the Pacific region, so I hope it will be talking to us about collaboration, not just across disciplines, but also across borders. Uh, um, and finally, um, Dr. Peter Smith, who is professor of, uh, and chief of cardiothoracic surgery at Duke. He's managed uh, a number of large and very important clinical trials and has been active in training surgical trial, clinical trialists and trying to promote clinical research capacity. So uh, in addition to managing teams, he's also, I think, thought a lot about how to train young stars to work in a team environment and we will be interested in hearing his thoughts on, on that. So um, let me just start. Um, with, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to get a discussion going among, among the panelists, but um, at least for the first question, maybe we can go up and down the line. Um, and it strikes me that we haven't really unpackaged over the last few days what this thing called team science is. 
um, and how it differs from whatever came before it. Um, so maybe we could just start by giving each of the panelists uh, just a few minutes, maybe three or four minutes, to say a little bit about what team science means in your own area or your own work. Uh, and um, why don't we start with Dr. Contractor? Sure. Um, thanks again for this opportunity. To, uh, it's been a terrific uh, day and a half here already. Um, in, in thinking about team science, um, there is obviously there are new terms that come in. The term team science as a term is, is relatively recent. But the idea, of course, goes back a long ways. We've been working in teams for a long time. And what got interesting out here was the notion that how do you think about science being done by a team? Until recently, we thought about the hero scientist, the person who, as an individual, was extremely successful. And you think historically, we can think of several scientists who, were, who are considered heroes, for the most part, and a few uh, heroines, but mostly heroes, uh, at least as history tells us. But I think that's a problem, because if we go back and look at it, each of these scientists who we now acclaim as giants uh, actually had a team that worked behind them. It was just that that team was never recognized, never acknowledged. And part of what we are now seeing is recognition that as we have increased specialization, it is not possible for us to ever think about a single individual being able to take on all of the issues that we need to. As the societal challenges increase, the amount of specialization that we have necessitates that we have to work with other people. And so that has made team science much more of a necessity today uh, than it was in yesteryears. The second the second part of that is that because of digitization, it is now possible to think about overcoming some of the challenges that deep collaborations had to face in the past. So in yesteryears, uh, we tended to work with people locally, or we tended to work by ourselves, because the cost of coordinating was much higher than the cost of, than the benefits that you would get from it. Now, because of technology, there is the possibility, the potential for us to be able to reduce those coordination costs so that the benefits that we get from those collaborations are now larger than the costs that we might incur. This is not always the case, but it is often the case. And so part of what we see in these kinds of scenarios is that the push towards team science has been propelled both by the challenges we face uh, and the specialization that we have, as well as the opportunities provided by the technologies in terms of uh, enabling team science. Hi, Laura Demopoulos, and again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's really an exciting um, and very novel conference. Um, as as Bobin said in the introduction, I'm trained as a as a clinical cardiologist, and in many ways, um, as Nushir touched on, my early career was. Um, focused on uh, sort of individual efforts and not so much uh, teamwork. Um, and that was really regardless of whether I was in an academic environment or an industry environment. Um, and in, in many ways, my responsibilities were um, facilitated that kind of individual effort. Uh, even in the care of a patient, if I needed uh, an infectious disease consult or a rheumatologist, you know, those were areas that I had a sufficient working familiarity with to feel as if I was still in control of what I was working on. And even my initial industry um, positions had that same sort of flavor to them. But more recently, um, with my uh, shift over to the Discovery Medicine Group at GlaxoSmithKline, um, there was a, probably just a concordance of um, something that um, uh, Nishir touched on in how our working environments have evolved in concordance with the different kind of dynamic that operates in a discovery medicine or very early phase pharmaceutical uh, division. And that is that um, being able to deliver a product working from um, a target identified, uh, you know, in some sort of highly experimental um, setting through early chemistry, biology, and initial clinical trials requires very diverse expertise. So much so that quite literally when I went to interview for the position and I understood how the group worked, I told uh, the hiring manager that I didn't feel I was qualified for the position because I didn't have sufficient expertise over all those areas. I'm not a chemist, I'm not a biologist, I don't really understand a whole heck of a lot about pharmacokinetics. Um, and since I felt I couldn't do that kind of work in isolation, do it on my own, 
Um, I didn't think I'd be able to do the job. And I think he half bit his tongue off trying to keep from laughing at me um, and said, you know, you're not going to do it on your own and you don't need to be expert in all of those areas. This is a place where we work in very diverse teams. And over the last several years, um, it's become evident to me how incredibly productive and strong that kind of diverse teamwork can be uh, in, in delivering, ultimately, um, a potential advance in, uh, in medical therapeutics. So I echo everyone up here in uh, thanking the Sinai team for putting such a wonderful conference together. Uh, so as the, the resident engineer up here, uh, I'll say that team science is kind of natural for the engineer. Uh, you know, when you think about it, we discover, and yes, we do discover, even as engineers, and of course we design, we optimize, and we ultimately look to try to commercialize what it is we do. Uh, and it requires significant teamwork. You need to have the scientists that are developing the fundamental basis for how knowledge is gained and moving that forward. We develop and we in in interact with multidisciplinary teams in order to get these things through, ultimately, again, out to impact society. Uh, and we can't do that without forming effective groups. And let me just give you at least one example that I think is relevant to stuff that we're doing uh, at RPI, but also relevant to what I've gone through as well as here being in a medical center. So a number of years ago, you know that one of the most significant drugs, heparin, uh, was uh, going into a crisis back in 2007, 2008, because of contamination that occurred uh, from overseas sources. Uh, and uh, a colleague of mine, Bob Linhart, who's a chemist, and I got together uh, to decide how can we deal with this? Can we go ultimately and develop a synthetic version, a bioengineered version? And so we had to put together a very broad team. Uh, we needed uh, the, the fermentation capability. We needed the bioengineering capability. We needed the chemistry, carbohydrate chemistry, analytical chemistry. We needed the preclinical groups. Uh, all of which had to come together in some way to enable us to go from the basic understanding of how we can generate very complex uh, pharmaceutical uh, and then ultimately how do we get it to be generated at scale, uh, generated cost effectively, ultimately getting it through the FDA and so forth and so on. Now we're not quite there yet uh, and there are a number of people here in the room that are working on that in our groups which is very nice that they're here. Uh, but to give you an idea of the uh, extent of the team science that's needed, uh, we didn't, any one of us, have expertise to address the entire problem. And yet we have come together to allow us to tackle something that for the last uh, uh, almost 100 years uh, has not been really attempted. Uh, and we'll see what the FDA has to say about this, but uh, we're getting there. And by the way, the idea is to separate the animal from the food chain uh, and also to uh, have a much greater control over the production of this important drug. Uh, and it's going to, we think, go along the lines of uh, insulin that was delisted from the FDA when the human form, human insulin, was uh, able to be generated. The other uh, area which I think is quite intriguing because it does involve Mount Sinai directly is our new Institute for Data Exploration or Application or the Rensselaer idea. Uh, I've got to come up with some good terms here. Uh, and that involves, as you can imagine, significant data analytics. And so whether it's healthcare analytics, business analytics, the built and natural environment, virtual augmented environments and so forth, uh, we're bringing together teams of biologists, uh, uh, computer scientists, uh, engineers of all types, business, and so forth to address a much broader uh, approach to how we deal with big data and then how we then take that big data and develop solutions to major problems. And one, of course, a major one being healthcare is one that we have now uh, entered into significant interactions with our major partnership here at Mount Sinai. So a whole spectrum, and again, as the engineer kind of being in the middle of it, uh, the whole spectrum from the basic discovery all the way through to partnerships and commercialization, we truly do celebrate uh, the need for major science, team science, team engineering too. Thanks. So 
Oh, hi. This is, I'm Anja König, Managing Director at the Novartis Venture Fund. Um, you're probably already familiar with what a venture fund does. We work heavily with universities and individual entrepreneurs to start up and finance and manage on the board level, in teams, um, directed science. The risk in these projects, since they're ver it's very early stage science, trying to come up with a medication, the technical risk in these projects is still very significant. I would say, though, that when we make investment decisions, probably the most important investment criterion is actually the strength of the management team. And when you look at the reasons why biotech companies fail, despite the tremendous technical risk that does exist, um, frequently the main reason is actually a failure of the management team or a failure of governments and the board, a lack of um, coherent strategy and a lack of good project planning because these companies are so small um, and funded down to the wire because venture capital is some of the most expensive money there is to fund your projects that you do not have a lot of wiggle room to make a lot of mistakes. And so you may find that if you don't have a cohesive team, you don't have a coherent plan and you don't have a team that also can react flexibly to the failures that inevitably will occur along the way as you manage your project, um, by the time that you've spent your 60 or $80 million on your company, you haven't even had a chance to find out if the medicine could have really worked, which is you know, always one of the tragedies that we encounter when we look at um, the venture capital funded model of innovation. So I would say it's a kind of a death and life uh, type situation, not, not exactly like in the Navy SEALs, but in a small biotech, the cohesion of the team and the vision, the motivation of each individual person who works there is absolutely critical and even more important than how compelling you thought the mechanism of action was when you first saw the business plan. So that's how important it is for us. And I would say that you know what I see here in this conference, which has been you know very, very interesting to see all this um, cross-disciplinary visions of teamwork is that the more directed uh, the project is, the more towards an objective, let's say bringing a medicine to market or rescuing a hostage, the more directed you are in a human endeavor, the more important teamwork seems to be. As you think about other areas of human excellence, um, it may be less important, for example, in poetry. Um, I don't know that there's that much teamwork when it comes to poetry, but um, or maybe abstract mathematics, abstract algebra. But I would say that um, what you always find is that humans are fundamentally a social animal. Um, and even if it's not cohesive teamwork that you get, the poets still need their coffee shops. Um, and you know that's actually very relevant because the kind of driving innovation is fundamentally also nurturing subversion in thinking. Um, and for this, it's not enough to build labs. Um, you also need to have those inspiring individuals, you need to have the coffee shops, you need to have the general sense of community um, of excellence. And this is where New York City, I think, has a really great environment, actually, much better than uh, a lot of places that try to invest a lot in infrastructure and attract the best people here. Um, you really have a vibrant intellectual community and you'll be able to attract uh, and build up these communities that can drive innovation. Should I say something more? No. 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 Okay. So, yeah, and all this discussion has caused me to think about what I, t what I discussed with an applicant to our thoracic surgery training program, and there are not that many nowadays. As some of you might know, we're an endangered species, uh, cardiac surgeons. That is. And uh, he asked, uh, well, what was special about Duke? Why, why did people come to Duke? And I, and I told him it was because um, of our program where we, we give th these folks in general surgery two years of training and then two years to do research. Um, just absolutely no clinical responsibilities whatsoever because our objective is to train academic surgeons. We like them to have that two years to get and experience is unlike what a medical student has, where you have responsibilities, see a lot of disease states, 
and formulate maybe a needs assessment for what might be there, but at that age, you have the ability to make contributions uh, that perhaps you can't do at any other age. This would be you know, two years out of medical school. And uh, you know, I pointed out that Duke has a huge uh, basic science uh, department in the university, medical basic sciences, and we have a large industry component in Research Triangle Park. And all those three things, along with uh, a non-urban setting, no offense to Mount Sinai, um, uh, makes it possible to uh, you know, have, make great contributions and become prepared to be uh, really a team player across, across all these potential disciplines that exist in the same place just for that one point in time in your life when you have some clinical knowledge and you're free to, uh, to explore with, without any other real responsibilities. You know, that was one aspect of it. Now back to the teamwork, uh, cardiac surgery is a team sport. As everyone knows, you can't do a heart operation by yourself. And so surgeons themselves tend to become uh, leaders, have to be good leaders. They have to have people be willing to work for them across disciplines. But primarily our contributions at my level are in comparative effectiveness research, clinical trials, and developing uh, cardiac surgeons who have uh, cl clinical trialist skills. And there's a dearth of them across the country as we've discovered over, over the last five years. And there's no industry interested in us. We're, we're small potatoes compared to most things that are going on. And so NHLBI is our, is our primary uh, funder, and we've worked pretty hard over the last couple of years collaborating amongst surgeons to do comparative effectiveness research. Just had a big publication yesterday about mitral valve disease where we challenged conventional wisdom, and the conventional wisdom turned out to be wrong, um, which was you know, quite the challenge. But the future for us, I think, and, and what a team means to me, is what we call the heart team. This is going to be surgeons and cardiologists cooperating together in the future, uh, and that's across disciplines. And I think that that's the biggest uh, challenge that we're facing now is this alignment in silos uh, in the treatment of heart disease by practitioners who spend 10 years training and developing sort of a psychophantic uh, isolationism where they think they know the answer. and merging with cardiology who has done the same thing, you know, so that we can uh, really guide best decision making and therapy. And that's, that's really where that team, I think, has to be developed. And it has to be developed around the cl clinical research subjects. Um, and that in itself is another huge challenge. En enrolling patients in clinical trials to, have, uh, to study comparative effectiveness really requires us to tell patients that we don't know the answer that we have equipoise, that we can provide two treatments. And you rarely will meet a surgeon or cardiologist that doesn't already know the answer, number one. And the patients want their physician to know the answer. They, they do not want to be told by their surgeon, I'm not sure whether I should repair or replace this valve. We'd like to flip a coin. They don't like that at all. And yet we have to do these things. Uh, and. Uh, I guess my only comment is that merging cardiology and surgery across these disciplines into one team is going to be uh, the best way to pr perform this effective clinical research in the future. Great. Thank, thank you all. Thank you all very much. So um, I, want to, um, uh, I want to get into the, the title of this, uh, of this session, which is Team Science in Academic Medical Centers in Pharma Settings. And, uh, um, in a minute, I'm going to ask the audience to talk a little bit, uh, hopefully with, with one another, about that. But I'm just sort of curious uh, about how, what the audience thinks about this, um, the non-tweeting audience. Uh, so, um, so how many people here think that team science is easier in industry uh, than in academe? Maybe, maybe just applaud if you do. And how many people think uh, in, uh, in industry it's easier? Maybe boo? Oh, I said this up, so you should, you should have all been booing. That was a test. Um, this is a failure of leadership. Uh, um, how many people think it's easier in academe? Boo? Boo, boo, boo. Boo? Oh, how many people aren't sure? Just hum. Uh, hmm, okay. 
um, anyhow, so that's uh, <laughs> some sort of feedback from the audience. Uh, so let's let, let's 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 see what the panel let's see what the panel has to say. So I guess in addition to that question about how team science is different or similar in academic medical center and pharma settings, um, I guess I, maybe also we can think a little bit about within sector variation. So Dr. Koenig uh, pointed out that uh, more directed projects are more suitable to to teams. Uh, Dr. Dordick mentioned that engineers are more kind of into teamwork, uh, perhaps genetically or by training, than uh, uh, than, our, than our basic scientists. So um, is there variation within academe and within academic medicine and how receptive different fields are? Um, is it old versus young people? Um, is, there, is there differences across across age? Um, so um, um, yeah, in general, um, let's, let's talk about diversity in, in team science across different contexts. Um, anyone want to lead off? Dr. Dordick, you've, uh, you've worked in both contexts. Because yeah. I'm, I'm an expert at uh, academic medical uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> science. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think that it, it, teamwork in a way is organic. We all want to work with each other. I think there are a number of stumbling blocks because everybody worries about how they're going to be recognized and so forth. But when you get over that, uh, I think the uh, uh, I'm not, I, I think in industry, the likelihood is that the team science would be expected to be uh, more easily done. I'm not 100% convinced of that. I think probably the best place for team science is probably in the small startup company. And I know I've, I've started a couple companies and I know that uh, what I often would, would do that would, would get people to think would be I go in at, at uh, you know, towards the end of the day to the company, I say, look to the to people, whoever I could find, say, is the company better off at 5 p.m., 6 p.m. today than it was at 8 this morning? And if the answer was yes, then you've succeeded. Uh, if the answer is no, then that's not pretty good, and I won't want to talk to our venture people about that. Um, uh, but I think that what what we at least try to do, uh, and it's ingrained more in engineering only because we do kind of teamwork design kind of projects, is we, we work towards getting the student early on to understand how they need to work with other students, and they all come together towards a project. Then when they get into their research, again, it's being able to work particularly in multidisciplinary environments. We, and, and for example, what we did in our biotech center was we got rid of departments. We just had a, a open laboratories, literally open labs, where you don't know where one faculty member's lab ended and another one began. And the students end up working with each other, talking to each other, even if they have no clue what their backgrounds were. I think that's really the most significant thing. And at least that can happen more frequently in the design of new kinds of facilities in an academic environment and probably also going on within academic medical environments. Uh, NIH has not been the most uh, upfront about being able to move towards teamwork, although they're trying to. Uh, other agencies, NSF and uh, Department of Defense certainly have been, and uh, so maybe NIH will move more quickly into that, which will drive some of the academic medical centers to do the same. Dr. Demopoulos, you've, you've worked in, in both settings. I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on that as well. Yeah, sure. Um, actually, if I'd been uh, on the other side of the podium when you were asking your questions, I think I would have been clapping with the, the first group. Um, certainly my own experience is that um, the sorts of effective teams that really drive delivery and innovation um, have been uh, more naturally apparent in an industry setting. And um, it, it's probably somewhat artificial to some degree. I mean, my own background, as I said, is in um, clinical cardiology and certainly in the care of an individual patient. Um, there, there is, you know, some some element of teamwork. The, the physician, the nurses, the pharmacists, the um, social workers, et cetera, who all may be involved in some way in the patient's care. But ultimately, um, it's the the primary caregiver who's orchestrating and um, leading. And there's very little of what. Um, Admiral Moore referred to earlier in the empowerment of um, the across the depth of the entire team. And um, I think since many of us who have a role in, in clinical research may have started out in that sort of environment, the mindset is much more about 
individual accomplishment and, and accountability than it is about um, working in a diverse team. And so my current role in discovery required really quite a, a mind shift on my part because as I said, I was no longer, I simply lack the, the tools required to do many aspects of the work that are critically important to um, accomplishing the, the, the goal of the group, which is to, you know, to bring a, a compound from um, target to uh, through its you know, early clinical development. And um, so in my, in my current role, and I think possibly it works well for some of the reasons that have been um, articulated by other panel members, is that GSK, and as, long, as well as I think many other large pharma companies now, has recognized the value um, of teamwork in this smaller environment and has constructed units that are uh, not unlike a small biotech, um, where there's a sort of a very focused uh, effort of a of a you know smallish group of people on um, the the progress of several uh, projects, and so the group that I'm in has accountability for cardiovascular products, but is really limited to about 60 people um, with diverse roles, whether it be in um, chemistry or biology or pharmacokinetics or, or clinical, and uh, no one person can do um, all of those roles. So I'm on teams that are composed of people with vastly different disciplines and uh, it's, it's almost comical sometimes the degree to which we find it difficult to communicate with each other because of our differing backgrounds. And so part of the effort and the success of our team is in learning how to um, speak each other's languages and to trust each other to uh, each complete our piece of the puzzle in order to deliver a whole. So um, the environment I'm in now is, is, as I said, rather unique, at least in my own experience, um, because of that diversity and the need for uh, every person to be accountable for delivering their piece of it, rather than the kind of top-down leadership uh, that doesn't um, empower or require uh, that kind of individual accountability across all team members. So does everyone agree that, that it's easier in industry than it is in, in academia? Does everyone on the panel agree? Any dissent? Maybe, maybe it just takes a different form. Uh, you know, say more. Yeah. what you've seen in what you see in academia is sometimes it's less a directed team than a community. Um, and an example I'm thinking of which has very impressed me is of what Hans Bethe did in the physics department at Cornell. Um, which is sort of an interesting tension between um, the great individual and the team they built, or maybe the community they built. Because sometimes you will have an extraordinary individual like Hans Bethe, who is not only um, an excellent scientist individually, but also a community builder. Somebody who has attracted uh, innumerable excellent other people and built up the Cornell physics department from nothing, essentially. Um, and if you see that you have people like this, uh, they will have disproportionate influence on your academic environment. And they can also have disproportionate influence on your startup environment. Because sometimes you get that combination of somebody who is both an entrepreneur um, and an excellent scientist. And those people are very, very rare. And I think um, the most important thing an institution can really do is to nurture those individuals when they appear. I think one of the, uh, I have two reactions to it. I'm going to first pivot off uh, the point that Anya made. You talked about um, Hans Bader, and it got me thinking. One of the differences uh, that I think exists in terms of teams in pharma versus academia is that, I may be wrong about this, so I'd be happy to stand corrected, but I think in general there is greater autonomy in terms of the assembly of teams in academia than they might be in pharma because that's much more directed way of looking at it, etc. And the story about Hans Bader made me realize how sometimes we assume that the tasks come before the team. We assume we have a task and then we go find the right team to do it. But in fact, in academia there have been some very stellar examples of something that is kept secret and that is often the team comes before the task. 
And there are two so small examples of this. One of the most highly cited statistical papers of all time, uh, the 19th most cited statistical paper, was written by Box and Cox. And if, for those of you who are statisticians, you know that when you do regression, you look at the, at the Box-Cox transforms in that area. Well, the story behind how this highly cited paper came about is because Box and Cox were concurrently the presidents of the American Statistical Association and the Royal Statistical Society. And they got along well, they were involved in a lot of different professional activities, and late one night when they were part of a group, people said, look, with names like Box and Cox, you have to get together and write a paper. <laughs> and so they said, you know, that in the, in the conviviality of the moment, they said, absolutely, let's shake on it. And the next morning, in the, in, the, in the moment of sobriety, they said, well, we've decided we're going to write a paper. What are we going to write it on? And lo and behold, from that came the 19th most cited statistical paper of all times, the Box and Cox paper that I was referring to. Another example of this was a paper that involved Hans Bader. It was, they were working and with uh, George Gamow and uh, others, and they said, uh, well, wouldn't it be great if we had a paper by Alphers, Bader, and Gamow? <laughs> And that, again, has become one of the best cited papers in, in physics, et cetera. All to say that there is a level of autonomy and that we shouldn't always assume that we first start with a task and put a team together, that relationships play an important role in how these teams come about. Actually, you need the right names. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> I, I do have a paper with a former student of mine whose last name is Grant, and my name is Contractor. So. <laughs> Can I just add one other issue here? I think that there is a tension throughout our discussion in the day and a half that I, I think it might be helpful for us to think about a little bit with the audience. Uh, here we are looking at team science, um, and yet we are looking for inspiration about this from a lot of different areas, right? We've talked, looked at sport, we've looked at uh, Navy SEALs, we've looked at composing, uh, co co composers, we've looked at casting in, in terms of theatrical performances, et cetera. And so, there's a side of me that says, we have to ask the question, is team science really that unique? And then that's why we're calling it team science, or should we really just be interested in the science of all teams and look at cross-cutting themes across this? And I was, I've been thinking about this a little bit as I've been hearing the sessions here today. Um, instead of thinking of these as sort of sectors that we look at, as we have been doing, are there certain cross-cutting themes that we can look at across these different sectors? For example, um, there are some teams that are much more focused on exploration of new ideas. Discovery, I think, would fall into that category. There are other teams that are much more, less focused on exploring new ideas, but more in exploiting existing resources. There's a standard tension between exploration versus exploitation, where you have the things that you want, and now what you're trying to do is exploit those resources. So you're not looking at new ideas. A third, uh, as much as implementing the ideas, a third could be mobilizing. You're getting people together in a team with the idea of creating some new standards, some new consensus, et cetera. Um, and a fourth one would be that you're putting together teams in terms of what I call swarming or rapid response. And I think the, the situation with SEALs would come into that situation. Emergency medicine would certainly fall into that. But then so does uh, disaster response of one kind or another. So I wonder whether instead of looking at saying whether team science is different in academia versus pharma or team science is different from the military, if it would be better served by looking at what are the goals of these teams within science? Are they more involved in exploration, exploitation, mobilizing, or swarming? Is that a question for the rest of the panel? Sure. Rest of the panel. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think it depends, again, on you are directed towards a specific goal, like bringing a medicine um, to the market, or you are engaged in you know, what sometimes used to be called curiosity-driven science. And I would say it's not an either-or. We need to have both. And there's plenty of examples of directed science and team-driven science. And one that's often mentioned is the Manhattan Project of something that's particularly worked well to a deadline, incredibly complex new science that resulted in um, the achievement of the goal. But behind that, it also would not have been possible without Lisa Meitner and Otto Hahn discovering fission in a completely different setting, in a curiosity-driven basic science type of setting. And they had that uh, luxury of having their team and uh, coming upon this discovery. And so without that, the Manhattan Project would not have been possible. And so we shouldn't lose sight of uh, allowing spaces for 
um, science that may appear useless, that may appear simply driven by the curiosity of the individual researcher, that may occasionally take 20 years to come to fruition, which isn't really in aligned with our grant structure. You can't really write it up in a two-year grant proposal, but there has to be space for that kind of science too. And so every time I visit a university out in the Far East, you know, who are very focused on infrastructure and directed science, and I find a guy who's working on uh, homosexual fruit flies, then I'm very heartened that they're on the right path, because this is a guy who's picking a professor at Beijing University, for example, um, and that's what interests him. And if he does it at a very high level of excellence, something good will eventually come out of it. And so I think it's important to uh, keep allowing space for that kind of science, less directed, more community-driven perhaps than assembling a team to get a drug to market in three years. And just on, on that point, just so you know we're paying attention, uh, tweets, uh, there, there was a, there was a, a, a tweet uh, earlier uh, on that exact point, which is maybe we're focusing too much on programming, uh, which is at least correlated right. with teams, as you noted, and not leaving, and that might crowd out uh, more curiosity-driven science, which might be less conducive to uh, at least some kinds of at least some kinds of teams. Any other thoughts on on that point? Well, I've been listening. You know, my team to do heart surgery is a hierarchical team. You know, so that it's multidisciplinary, but in the end, the surgeon has to decide. So that's you know, part of a team is the team leader. And as I, as I was listening to our keynote address speaker, I, I didn't hear the part that I've come to understand is important when managing a team, which is, is to be able to listen and listen effectively and not to inhibit uh, others from speaking their minds. And, you know, when I think about the freedom of academia, it's forming teams that are people who are not like you, who are going to have a different perspective and being able to work with those people and true, if you are the listener, you're the leader. Which would, which, right, which would suggest a very different dynamic um, from certainly uh, the Navy SEALs uh, 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 teams, um, or at least maybe not very different, but at least different to the extent that autonomy is a, is a kind of an important thing that's come up a number of times now uh, in academe that, that may not be... Uh, uh, may not be as salient in, in, other, in other settings. Um, I, I want to go back to you, uh, Dr. Smith. Um, so our time, I think, is a little bit compressed here, right? Is that, is that, so we, we started a little bit late. Um, so maybe we can jump to kind of the road ahead uh, and, uh, and, 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 you know, what, what, we're, what we want from team science going forward and what kind of uh, architecture we need to set up to make it all work. Um, and I want to talk about training. Um, so how does, how does training of, uh, uh, in academe need to, need to change going forward, or does it, uh, recognizing the, uh, uh, the growth of team science? Well, as I already mentioned, I think uh, you know, having some openness at that age range with that degree of training, I think, is the critical thing. This is the way Duke's been doing it for 50 years is having a, a two-year period of uninterrupted time and giving people the freedom to work across any discipline that exists in the university, you know, without any pejorative attached to it. Uh, and th th that's the mechanism that we think is best to uh, get the best ideas and to get the, the uh, resident grounded in the subject. You know, for the, fu uh, the future for us, at least in surgery, is... Uh, probably going to be more about comparative effectiveness research and uh, training in biostatistics, epidemiology, uh, and uh, things of, of this nature. You know, we can make contributions by identifying problems and working with pharma, and, and we've done that uh, many times, but I, I think our real contribution is going to be in uh, moving to the next step in clinical research, which I, I really think is going to be registry-based research. Uh, which will be much more effective, um, get many more patients, and um, is, is really going to require some changes to the way we think about uh, people's individual information, privacy, protection, and uh, really how uh, health systems work to collect clinical information on patients, but to have an overlay here uh, of um, randomization that can occur in, in a much less expensive way than we do it now. 
Uh, any other thoughts on the training side, either from academia or from industry? I thought, I, I, I thought a lot about various aspects of training, although at a lower level, both undergraduate, graduate training, and so forth. While at the undergraduate level, having a discipline is absolutely critical, because it really allows you to think in a very focused area. Uh, at the graduate level, I think many times our disciplines have been set up, which actually restricts the team interaction. Uh, the breadth of going beyond uh, your specific major, so to speak. And so while I think that that has served well in many respects, I think as we start moving more towards going after tougher problems, uh, that sometimes being in a specific discipline at the graduate level, and then certainly beyond that at postdoctoral, actually inhibits the interaction we're looking to achieve. And, and that is not simple because Academia is very entrenched in very specific programs. Training programs have been developed, but they're still, in many cases, uh, not quite as interdisciplinary as they are made out to be. Uh, uh, grad students have to do thesis work, uh, and there's an individuality associated with that regardless. And the individuality associated with that is actually important because it allows a person to take a problem and look towards a solution as their major contribution. But I think what we need to do better is how we can show or have an individuality of a thesis but being part of a broader effort. Even if that's only to to have discussions with those other groups out there that maybe don't end up in a thesis but still enrich the field. So I think that's a challenge. Uh, almost all academic programs have the same challenge. We are not particularly good at solving that, but I think if we look towards what would a graduate program look like in five to ten years or beyond, that's what we ought to look at. And I think uh, the ones, the groups that do that quicker and better will be the most successful. So th this, came, this came across on Twitter. Uh, does the uh, incentive system or reward system of academe need to be changed in order to accommodate that, uh, in order to make uh, the academic uh, atmosphere more sort of friendly to, to teamwork? Um, Dr. Dr. Contractor, have you, have you thought about this? Sure. It's, uh, it's obviously an issue that has been uh, on, on the front burner, frankly, for the last several years now, especially with the increase in, in team science. And I think that there are already models that this is changing in some, in some fields more than others, but others are looking at those examples. Uh, so for example, uh, until a few years ago, uh, there was no credit that would be given to somebody who spent a better part of their pre-tenured career putting together large databases or cataloging or cleaning large uh, databases and so on and so forth. Uh, today, that's changed in certain fields, such as in chemistry, et cetera. People, the profession, the discipline as a whole has recognized that since these are really critical contributions that have to be made, that those could be acknowledged and be considered as important points for um, being able to get tenure. So, Different disciplines are at varying stages in their appreciation and their understanding of how different tasks within the scientific enterprise need to be incentivized, rewarded, acknowledged in order to move the whole field forward. I think in terms of your original question on training, um, at the undergraduate level, we've, you, you mentioned this uh, already a, a bit, but um, Jonathan, at the undergraduate level, we say we want people to be in certain disciplines, obviously. You also want people to learn how to communicate Better. This is sort of almost a cliche. And I think uh, one of the issues that I think we need to look at today is not just to help our uh, young students communicate better, but to think about a second skill set, which is a collaborative fluency, the ability to collaborate better. And this is not something that we train. I mean, communicating effectively is important, uh, not to discount it, but I think there's an additional skill set of collaborative fluency that we don't train our undergraduates to do, and I think that's going to become increasingly important uh, in the context of teamwork. At the, at the, at, in terms of at the professional level, one of the things we've spent a lot of time focusing in training models is to take a team after it's put into place and to see how to make it more effective. And obviously that's extremely important because lots of things can go wrong in a team. But there is much less effort and attention put 
to how people form the team in the first place. That is, how do they assemble the team? Think about it. All of you, every day, are deciding to be on a team or deciding to put people on a team. What are the factors that go through your mind in choosing what people you want to put on a team, and how does that have consequences in terms of the performance of the team? Uh, I'm working on a book right now titled Some Assembly Required. It's about the process of putting teams together. And what we are finding in the research is that the factors that people use to form teams are often not the best factors to get high performance from those teams. And so the assembly of team is an area that I think is largely neglected, but clearly one that we need to think about more strategically. Can I, can I hear some more on the demand side? So again, I'm, I'm fascinated by this Twitter feed. Uh, uh, it, I mean, one of the questions is maybe we should start granting group PhDs, allowing students from different disciplines to come together for one unified thesis. Now that strikes me as a very radical change, as I understand uh, the history of academe. Um, and I just wonder a little bit about, well, how industry feels about this. Should, should academe be radically changing what it's doing, or should it just lead the teamwork to, to industry and, and focus on letting curiosity-driven research go where, it, go where it goes? Yeah, well, I'll try and comment there. Um, actually, I, I, I love this idea. Um, and I think, although uh, I have to agree with you that it's radical, probably some form of um, revolution, perhaps better than the ongoing evolution that, that you referred to um, would, would, uh, would help with productivity tremendously. Um, I have to say that, you know, in my own, from my own experience, a lot of what's driven um, my shift back and forth, and I have gone back and forth and back and forth between industry and uh, academics several times, um, it was my, my frustration in the academic environment in not being able to form and then um, get appropriate recognition or compensation for teams. And I think you're right that it has proceeded at different paces in different um, disciplines, but certainly in, uh, in the area of medicine, I think it, it has fallen behind. And just a, an aside as regards to training, I think I've seen several very well-developed um, internship programs for the more basic sciences like chemistry to have people rotate through and spend a year in industry to understand what the practice of chemistry is like in an industry environment as opposed to an academic environment. The same doesn't exist um, for, for medical training, or at the very least is, is vastly underutilized. So those sorts of um, changes to the entire training structure and um, recognition of teams such as group PhDs. I have no idea how you'd implement that, but those sorts of uh, innovative thoughts and allowing for um, more cross-collaboration among disciplines, I think, would, would greatly advance our ability to, uh, to be able to deliver innovative products. I would just like to defend the individual a little bit. Please. Just to be... Um, obstreperous. You know, I think teams are really great, but it's not the solution for everything. And um, especially in curiosity-driven science, you know, maybe individual or very interior arts like poetry or abstract mathematics, I just don't see how a group PhD would be possible. And I don't really see um, that a lot of the people that in the past have contributed uh, significantly to those areas of human excellence uh, would have even survived that kind of training because you know sometimes they're not the most sociable people and uh, where should they go if not to the university um, you know do you see uh, do you see Galois uh, or grumpy Friedrich Gauss really um, getting a group PhD you know, I have a hard, little bit of a hard time. You know, this may be okay for some people, but not others. And you know, that's part of diversity and uh, community to let those um, introverts do their thing and do their magic. Where would the introverts go if not academia? Right. Uh, it's a good question. It's a good question. Not, not, uh, the, Navy, not, the, not, not the Navy SEALs. <laughs> Because we were all below average athletes in high school, I think. Uh, okay, so I, I want to I open this up to the, to the, to the crowd. Um, but first, I mean, are there any questions that the panelists have for one another, or should we open it up to uh, the audience? Okay, let's open it up to the audience. We have about seven minutes. Um, so I guess identify yourself if, you're, if you don't mind. Uh, 
before you ask a question. This has been a, just a wonderful session. I, um, I wanted to bring, so I'm Sandra Mazur. I'm part of the faculty here. Um, uh, from the group at Northwestern, there's been a remarkable number of good scholarship in terms of the impact of teams in science. It's really been, uh, I think, framing the whole picture for us. But there's also a whole literature, again, from the social scientists on the importance of diversity of a team. And that's not just in terms of each person bringing a different skill, but a different perspective. And it's been shown that, again, the ability, the collective intelligence of a team is dependent upon the makeup of the team and often a good way to determine how, um, how creative the solution will be to a problem is by indicating the number of women who are on the team. This seems to be because they listen better than the men do. Uh, there's a very interesting study in science by Woolley et al. Yeah. Um, about this. And similarly, in terms of dealing with unexpected consequences that often women are more willing to change the view and to uh, present a new hypothesis rather than digging their feet in. So I was just wondering if you see, in, in as you look at teams, whether the diversity, whether it's cultural, going past the technological, cultural, gender dependent, whether this makes a difference in the creative responses to problems. I, I, can, I can start uh, responding to that. So thank you for your kind words for a shameless plug for my university there. Thank you. And I'm also very familiar with uh, the work that you referred to, Anita Woolley and her colleagues, um, Tom Malone and others who are working in the area of collective intelligence. I think you began to scratch the surface about how diversity is important in so many different dimensions. I think that there is um, work done by Scott Page at the University of Michigan who's written a book called Difference where he talks about diversity of groups and find some, has some interesting findings where you might think that groups that are very similar would be less creative on average than groups that are different, which is not exactly what he finds. He finds that on average, these two sets of groups are equally creative. The difference is in the variance or the, the variability, where diverse groups can be extremely innovative or they can fall apart and be extremely uncreative and destructive, if you may. So it, that, there, there is an importance in diversity. The issue that you raised about women being important is, is, is definitely a one that we have found. It's one, I think, of many other dimensions that we could probably find. And I think about this in the context in sort of three different dimensions. One is, when we put teams together, we need to look at the characteristics of the people, the attributes of the individuals, and we look at skill sets. Do we have the expert on topic X, topic Y, topic Z? That by itself is not going to be enough. We need to look for the mix in terms of personalities, in terms of diverse perspectives that need to come into place there. The second bucket is to look at the relationships amongst the people. Do these people all know each other? Have they worked previously? Do they get along? Do they trust one another? And mind you, it's not always good if everyone on the team has known each other or trusts each other. A certain amount of diversity there is also important. And then finally, the third bucket is when you look at a team, Think about all the other people that these team members belong to, because the reality is we belong to multiple teams at the same time with overlapping membership. And what we are beginning to learn now about teams is that a team's success depends not only on the connections within the team, but the other connections they have with other teams and the other teams that those people belong to, because all of these filter in ideas, both substantive as well as process issues. So I think that there is a lot of, uh, we are getting ready now, in my opinion, to say that when you want to staff teams, there was a question on Twitter about can NIH help put teams together, um, I think that we should begin to think that it's not that far away where we can have a money ball for creating scientific teams just like we do in athletics and other areas. Other thoughts on diversity? No. Let's take another question. Yeah, uh, so the notion of <clears throat> group PhDs piqued my interest since I'm dean of the graduate school here. Um, <laughs> I don't think I would favor it on any large scale, because one of the things that I often say to our students is you have to master a discipline so that you can bring something to the interdisciplinary table. And I, the associate dean of the grad school here, I just heard him say he disagrees. Um, <laughs> but we often disagree. It's, gonna, a, it's a great relationship. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think there's a stage of training where this would be a, a superb idea, and that's the postdoctoral training experience. So I'd like to hear some of your comments on that. That is where I really do think we need to encourage teams and team projects and 
break down the barriers and get people to understand that they can have um, joint joint custody of a project and 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 all all get credit for it. I think I'm not sure I'd want to see that at the level of the thesis. But John, I'd like to hear your comment on that. Uh, well, I don't like the idea of a joint or a group PhD, even though I feel that uh, yes, we, uh, we have been too individualistic at, at, in the education and the training. Uh, because I think still the individualistic aspect is critical as someone uh, in their most formative years develops themselves into a scientist or engineer. Uh, at the postdoctoral level, I think it's much easier. That's true. But even at the graduate level, if we as faculty members don't provide an education about what the world is like, why you need to have teams to solve big problems or, or difficult problems, and why you're fooling yourself that you're going to be, no matter if you're the next uh, most brilliant person on the planet, you can't solve every problem that you're, you come up against by just doing it yourself. Uh, if we don't do that, then we're not training correctly. And so I think at the graduate training level, absolutely, we need to instill upon them the idea of being able to form at least either teams or learn about what else is needed to help solve a problem, but then still have the individual PhD. Uh, I think that's still critical for how we go. And I will say, getting back to another thing about uh, in how we train even at the undergraduate level, uh, in engineering, for, for a lot of reasons, primarily because engineers typically went to industry more than academia, we've always had students that go and spend time in industry. I've had many students come in and say how great it was, they're going to do what now go into industry. Of course, I've had many students come back and say how horrible it was, and, and they never want to go into industry. Um, it obviously depends on who they're working with and, and what company they go to. But that's something that we can and probably should build in now more across the board. Uh, I think it would be relatively straightforward, except for the faculty member who says, well, why should my student go away for three or four to six months when they're at the most productive state? Uh, well, well, we'll deal with that as it comes. But nonetheless, I think that's an opportunity. And industry should embrace that and work with academia to do that. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, yeah <clears throat> I'm uh, Dr. Lebo at Mount Sinai, Department of Geriatrics and Medicine. The issue of the team leader has not been discussed in great depth and is essential to the success or failure. There are matters of uh, gender, race, age, credentials, and personality. Perhaps you'd comment on that. Uh, is that directed to someone in particular, or uh, does someone want to be the team leader here? <laughs> <laughs> no, sure. I mean, no. I can touch briefly on a couple of issues. We've talked a little bit about leadership, and we've talked about teams. There is a, 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 a growing body of research that also recognizes that we don't only live in teams, but we live in teams of teams. Um, and these are sometimes referred to as multi-team systems. And a lot of what I, I heard Peter, for example, talk about is that they may be in a single leader at the end, but there are multiple teams or component teams that might have their own leaders. And so the notion of distributed leadership is getting a lot of currency, uh, certainly in online communities and, and so on. There's some interesting work done on, on leadership roles amongst people who are writing things on Wikipedia, for example, in crowdsourcing. I'm not sure how much of that would directly apply in the context uh, that we're discussing here today. But I think uh, recognizing that leadership doesn't have to be just a single person, that there are no different models of collective leadership, distributed leadership. Um, and that is not the same as what we heard this morning, where if you don't have a leader, the team could still be go good, but may just go off in a different direction is what we heard from uh, the Admiral this morning. But I think that recognizing that we are in teams of teams, and sometimes the component teams may not have the same uh, overall objective as the, as the multi-team system is an important uh, recognition that we need to keep. I'll just add one additional comment that may be, it's certainly applicable in my area and maybe um, applicable to some of yours as well, which is that, you know, by definition, I work on um, projects that are intended to be in transition. So, you know, they're going to go from a test tube to a, you know, a, a rat to a person to, you know, a, a large population with a disease state. Um, and 
different leaders, different team leaders are appropriate through each of those phases. And this is something we struggle with, and I don't think we've learned to do it very well yet, but um, we're actually literally now trying to establish some guidelines for exactly how the team leadership, not to mention some of the remainder of the members of the teams themselves, may evolve as a project advances. So the person who leads the team when it's um, you know, a, a target sketched on a piece of paper, uh, that could never be me. I don't understand anything about that. And you know, that's different from the person who's going to shepherd it through the preclinical phase, and then eventually, many years down the road, it, it would come to me. I likely was a team member from the very beginning, but may not become the team leader for another um, you know, five, eight, 10 years, depending on the, the project. And then I'll hand it over to somebody else who will take it through, presumably, to its eventual um, uh, you know, registration and distribution. And so that, that concept, I mean, that, that idea of um, diversity of, of teams, uh, team leaders may be quite literal in that the team leader itself may be a different person through the different phases of the project. So uh, uh, just uh, one last comment. I'm not, so, I'm not sure we uh, answered your question uh, 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 exactly, but uh, I will say, I, I mean, just if I can editorialize in, in, in my role as moderator, I think it's a very important question. Uh, um, I mean, there's a, there's a long history of research on inequity in science uh, across different dimensions. And one of the interesting questions is, as we move towards more team science, is that going to ameliorate or exacerbate uh, inequity across the different dimensions that you, that you talked about? So I think it's an interesting one to continue to, to, to think about. Um, but please join me in thanking, thanking the panel for an exciting <laughs>